Coming up, we talked yesterday about how Ohio State somehow still ended up ranked higher than Michigan in the first SP Plus prediction polls from ESPN. I said that that could have something to do with Ohio State's lead in recruiting. We'll talk to John Garcia Jr. to find out exactly how big is that gap between the top two recruiting teams in the Big Ten. You are locked on Big Ten, your daily podcast on the Big Ten Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You're tuned into Locked On Big Ten alongside John Garcia Jr., our football recruiting expert here. I'm Nate Dickinson. Thank you as always for tuning into the program as we get a little bit into recruiting here with John. And I want to get a little bit more big picture today, because while over the last week there weren't really any sort of big commitments across the conference in the Big Ten, we did talk yesterday about the SP Plus rankings from ESPN, and part of that is recruiting. And part of it was a big part of the conversation we had then. So figured we got the chance to get John. When we can get John, we get John. So we'll take a couple of minutes and talk to him about this thing here. What I want to get into with you, John, is the difference between the gap between Ohio State and Michigan, and also just in recruiting classes kind of in general and where they're ranking. Because as I'm looking up and down here, I'm seeing, and we'll get into a little bit, the differences between what Ohio State and Michigan does, but I'm not sure like how much to weigh that Ohio State side as better than Michigan. Because the three things that SP Plus ranking gets into is returning production, recent history, and recent recruiting. Returning production, I think goes to Michigan. They've got their quarterback coming back. They've got the running back coming back. Ohio State has more questions, even if you think there's a whole lot of talent coming back. As far as recent history, obviously that goes to Michigan. So that must mean that if Ohio State's ranked over Michigan in this ranking, which they are, they must be killing it in the recruiting rankings. I mean, as we know, it's always Ohio State and then Michigan and then everyone else in the Big Ten. How big do you view that gap between those top two teams, though? I think it's considerable, Nate. It's... And it depends on how you view recruiting. Let me let me put it that way. If we're talking about trajectory and and five stars, then yeah, it's a pretty considerable gap because Ohio State is in that Georgia Alabama territory that is kind of tier one, and Michigan's near the top of tier two from that perspective. But if you go depth development, it really just depends on how you look at the talent. I mean, who has developed better on the offensive and defensive line than Michigan? Uh, over the last five years or so. George is probably in that conversation, but you go a few other schools before you got to an Ohio State in that regard. So in terms of of high-profile, blue-chip, high school All-America talent acquisition, yeah, I think Ohio State is far and away the top program in the Big Ten. But when you talk about volume, development, and now the transfer portal is going to start to sneak into that conversation too, Michigan is right there, if not well ahead, of Ohio State. So I think it's really a view perspective. If you're viewing the floor, I'd go with Michigan uh, from a recruiting and talent acquisition standpoint. If you go ceiling and upside, you probably go Ohio State because they do go out and win more of these national battles. But then that goes into a whole other conversation. How much should we weigh the outlets that, you know, for three of them, how much should we weigh those outlets as, as they go through this process? All of them have gotten better. All of them have reflected, you know, uh, all conference, all American, high NFL draft picks more than not over the last 10 or 15 years, but how much of of that should truly be weighed in this specific ranking? I think it's obviously subjective to a degree. And in that regard, I do still feel like the Ohio State scholarship offer carries a little bit more weight than that of Michigan. But again, all those perceptional elements can change. And if the on-field trend continues, that perceptional element will change along with it. What are all the teams that you put in that tier one a year in and year out doing it the way Ohio State does? I think Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, I think Texas is close. Uh, Texas has been able to do that through multiple coaches, but they obviously haven't been able to sustain it, develop it, and or produce it on the field. So really hard to lock them into that, that tier one. So it might just be those three. We used to throw Clemson in there, not the same. Ditto for USC. Um, A&M obviously was there two years ago, but but consistency-wise, I I think it could just be those three programs. I think a Texas, a Notre Dame, um, those schools are threatening to a degree, 
But from a consistency standpoint, I think it might just be those three schools as things currently stand. So just looking across, Ohio State's pretty consistent. I mean, they're top five just about every single season. Then you get into Michigan, which like this year is a, this year being 2023, a number 18 class in the nation, which is pretty low for them, to be honest. But the year before that, a number nine class in the nation. So if they're in that kind of a range, like how big is the difference between in an individual class, if you're Michigan, being in that top 10 compared to being in that top 15, top 20? It's really about that same perceptional gap we talked about between Ohio State and Michigan. It's the margins of the elite players, the very you know high level five star All American types. You just got a couple more on board uh, if you're in the top five versus being in that that ten to twenty range. It, it it does matter from a volume standpoint as well. Not the biggest fan of that personally, but it does come into play when we're talking about the, the sport of football because depth and volume and numbers have always been a part of the conversation. But really, when you're looking at two classes with the same amount of recruits, how could they be 10 to 15 spots different? It's usually just about the very top or the very bottom of that class. Does Ohio State break down into the three-star range as much as Michigan breaks into the five-star range? Maybe. Maybe it's close in that regard. But at the very top, I do think we, we do see a pretty consistent gap between Ohio State and Michigan, and, and it's frankly Ohio State and everybody not named Georgia, Alabama at this point, uh, which is why some of the recent on-field trends are, are so surprising and why I'm sure your audience is asking more questions about Ryan Day and that coaching staff than maybe ever before. So what what you probably you probably went into it a second there when you did, were breaking that down, but when you're first looking at a recruiting class, or I guess just taking a first look in a while at a recruiting class, I'm sure you're always looking at the recruiting classes, of course, but when you're first looking at a recruiting class and just looking at all the numbers, what numbers are you looking at first? Is it that top? Is it that bottom, the floor? What numbers are most important to you when you're trying to establish, okay, what kind of a class is this exactly? Instead of just saying it's the number five, number 10 class. Right. I, I, I agree that it, it should be beyond some kind of algorithm when we look at these classes, are you are you meeting needs? Are you are you filling holes? And then are you are you hitting the premium positions important? Um, you know, Michigan didn't bring in a quarterback last cycle. You know, Ohio State did. You know, that's an easy measure to look at one to one because usually you only bring in one or you don't. Um, but I like to look at the position groups that are brought in in the trenches again, where we, we spent a lot of time between these two. You could argue Michigan out recruited Ohio State just in this past cycle, even though Ohio State's class overall was ranked higher because you had the All-American quarterback. You had the best receiver class maybe in the country going to Ohio State. So those highs can push the overall class higher than kind of a, a more consistent floor at other positions. So I look at filling holes, obviously the premium positions, and, and then position groups. You know, I think that's where you can start to see you know, how a recruiting class comes together because you don't always need to have a bunch of volume at certain positions. But if you hit a couple of measures within that, you can still be viewed successfully. For instance, if, if you're Ohio State, did you have to bring in four receivers in this cycle uh, to, to complement the, the returning roster? You didn't have to. And then the portal, how much does that start to factor in? Uh, Michigan's not going to use it as much as some of these other schools are from a talent acquisition and volume perspective. How much should that stuff be considered? And I think that only speaks more to the positive developmental perception that Michigan has really commanded over the last couple of seasons. How long do you think it takes for that advantage to change and shift the other way if Michigan keeps doing what it's doing on the field against Ohio State? Because in my eyes, as long as the Buckeyes keep churning out top five quarterbacks and first round wide receivers, they're still going to have the guys over Michigan. And that's that's where the margin is, is really glaring, right? Because for for the recruits of yesteryear, Nate, this is about Saturdays, right? It's about winning the rivalry, winning the conference, having a shot at, at the big ring, right, at the CFP. But in this day and age, it's about the individual branding, and, and the NFL means more than Saturdays does. So because of that, I think you're still going to see – independent of head coach, independent of, of the on-field rivalry product and measurement, you're still going to see certain programs recruit at a higher clip because of that. Uh, and Ohio State's one that has been able to do it 
uh, across the board at the most easy to see positions of late, like you mentioned, quarterback, wide receiver, defensive back, pass rusher, all the premium positions we talk about, Ohio State has has really um, fulfilled the NFL with a bunch of those type guys. So that still very much does matter. But again, Michigan's starting to push back against that part of it as well. So over time, it will take a few years for that perception to shift. But even if there's still one first rounder every year at Ohio State, they'll still be able to use that on the trail and it will still matter. Well, we'll see what ends up happening. It's been, it's been a couple of years now with Michigan at least taking the advantage in that one week on the field, but on all the other weeks, Ohio State still looks just as attractive to any recruit who's trying to make that choice. So we'll see what happens. Ohio State's a powerhouse. We already knew that. Didn't need to bring in John to tell you that one, but we'll have him back in to tell us all sorts of other stuff at some point soon, I know. Thank you again, John, for just taking a couple of minutes here to have this more kind of big picture conversation with us on recruiting. We'll get into more specifics here soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to John Garcia Jr. for joining us for a few minutes to chat here on the show. Really, of course, just had some stuff going through my mind, wanted to get the expert in to get his takes on what exactly separates the recruiting classes. And I thought he gave us some really good stuff, as always. We'll get continue on with the show here in just a minute. But first, the midway point of the NBA season is here. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel. America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained too. Of course, the NBA season's in full swing. The Big Ten season is in full swing. Hockey's still going on too. If you want to bet on any of it, you can do it over at FanDuel. And if you hear any lines here on the show, which you do, you'll be able to get them over at FanDuel. We pull them right from the site, so you can follow along with us at FanDuel and their sports book. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss out on a chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Also, thank you as always for making Locked On Big Ten your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's dive into the big win of the night. I didn't think Northwestern had it in them to pull off two wins against the two best teams in the Big Ten. But then again, maybe Northwestern is one of the two best teams in the Big Ten. The standings say it right now. We'll get into that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about this game. A huge, huge Northwestern lead at halftime. I didn't catch the first half of this game, actually, but I saw that halftime score. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun one to watch down the stretch. And it was. Northwestern held its lead throughout the second half, but of course, Indiana had a run in them. But give credit to Northwestern, too. This lead was at 21 points at one point. Indiana made its run, but still with about like four minutes left. Northwestern still had the Hoosiers at arm's length. Indiana makes a comeback. Northwestern makes a couple of mistakes down the stretch, which, of course, worries you if you're a Wildcats fan. But The point is, is that they did not let it absolutely tear them apart. And in the final stretch of the game, Boo Booey drives in on Trey Galloway, maybe extends the arm a little bit, maybe pushes off a little bit, gets the bucket to go. But if you're an Indiana fan, and I saw a whole lot of stuff on Twitter and elsewhere too, where Indiana fans complained incessantly about this call at the end. And I had to watch it back a few times because I was like, was this that bad? Was this that bad of a missed call where it was like so clear Boo Booey was just pushing Trey Galloway out of the way? And, And listen, when you're watching it live and when you watch it on the replays, you can see Galloway has a force going up against him that pushes him and gives Boo Booey separation for sure. Can you say that that's part of just the two of them driving to the hoop together? Possibly. Could you say it's an elbow being deliberately pushed in the way of Galloway that should have been an offensive foul? Possibly. But if you're an Indiana fan who was complaining the way that Indiana fans were complaining, not just saying, yeah, that could have been an offensive foul, but saying we got robbed of that game. There's no way you can say that that was an obvious offensive foul. No way at all. 
it could have been called. You're right. It could have been called. And the things that I described as what I saw happening could have been defined as an offensive foul in the rules of the game. However, Trey Galloway was, of course, nowhere near set, but that's not what the Indiana fans were arguing here. And he didn't even try really to take a charge. Uh, of course, in that situation, you wouldn't be trying to take a charge in any way, but it, he didn't try to make it look like there was an offensive foul on any who he, he was, of course, just right back up to Bowie trying to defend his shot. So you don't really, of course, blame Trey Galloway, but when you're going at the basket at a high speed like that, and to give Northwestern its credit, Boo Booey got a step on it. Galloway maybe made it up and then Bowie pushed off, but he had a half step at least going to the basket off there. And they met at around a little after outside the block. Bowie puts up a floater that he makes. Galloway ends up getting pushed off. I thought did actually a really good job jumping back and getting in the face of the shot there. But Bowie made it. And you could say it was an offensive foul. But if you're sitting here saying there's no way that that one could have been called that way if you're playing this game fairly, no, it's, it wasn't that obvious. It wasn't that big of a thing. It's an Indiana fan base frustrated. I'm sure that the comeback fell short. Frustrated, I'm sure, with everything that happened in the first half of that game with Indiana scoring just 20 points. But overall, I, I think it's your fandom getting in the way here. If you watch it, yeah, you, you can say it's an offensive foul. But there's no way that it was any sort of thing where there's blatantly, obviously, something going on where the referee is supposed to be able to call that charge. No way at all. And you can't blame the ref for not calling it. You can't blame the ref, certainly, for letting him play the game at the end. I mean, we saw what happened in the Super Bowl. It's Even if you think it's a hold, even if it's not a hold, it's something that was going to bring up a whole bunch of controversy. And it's something that I think just about everyone was saying, just let him play at the end, or at least the majority. In that one, they let him play. And Trey Galloway, by the way, knew that they were going to let him play because even though he did think he got pushed on and he gave about a quarter of a second of a complaint to the referee before looking back and trying to make something out of those last couple of seconds, even if he was doing that, he, he knew like, hey, this is final play of the game. This is me against this guy one on one. And top of the key, he got a step on me and he made a shot. That's all it is, really. So if you want to complain about it, fine. But Northwestern did what it had to to win that game at the end after doing just about all it could to to lose it in the earlier parts of that second half. But Northwestern got the win. And I don't think that Indiana fans really have that strong of a complaint. Just my personal opinion. Anywho, in other stats of this game, uh, you have shooting was bad. 37% for Northwestern in a win. Uh, Indiana was sloppy, or you could say Northwestern was incredibly clean. Northwestern only had... Four turnovers in this game to Indiana's 13. Indiana took more shots, just or it didn't make quite, it didn't work out. It, it, nobody shot good from three, 25% both sides. It was something where Northwestern just played a better game in the first half, of course, and Indiana played a much better game in the second half. And at the end, we were tied, and Northwestern got the last shot and made it. That's it. These are two good basketball teams, is what I'm trying to say. We said it before. I said it before on yesterday's show. If Indiana loses to Northwestern, or if Northwestern gets this second win in a row, we stop having the conversation about, is this a tournament team? Is this a team that can make an upset in the round of 32 against a one or a two seed? And now we have to start having the conversation of, is this one of the best teams in the Big Ten? And I think Northwestern's doing it. And Boo Booey said it after the game, and I quote, more people need to wake up. This isn't luck. It can't be luck at this point. He's right. I have my opinions. But I, I will not deny the clear evidence in front of me that says that Northwestern is a team that's ready to make a run here. I, I don't know if the talent on paper is there. But they've got here a good stretch down the, a good schedule down the stretch to at least try to prove it. So how exactly good can Northwestern get? What is the ceiling here? Well, right now they're second place in the Big Ten. They're two games behind Purdue. And as far as catching the Boilermakers go, Northwestern, of course, has the tiebreaker. But to make up two games, uh, Northwestern has five games against teams that are either tournament teams or potentially tournament teams. Iowa, Illinois, Maryland, and Rutgers are all in the tournament. And then Penn State's still there fighting to get back on the bubble, too. That's a good slate down the stretch. And if Northwestern wants to prove it's legit good good, 
it's going to be able to move pretty far up the bracket if it can win those games. Meanwhile, Purdue, it has another game against Indiana. If it loses that game, slips up one place else, whether it be Maryland, whether it be Illinois, is there a path to win the Big Ten? It seems crazy, but that's what I guess I'm pointing out, is that Northwestern has a path to win the Big Ten regular season. And they've already proven that they can win the Big Ten tournament too. So we'll see what ends up happening with the Wildcats. But who would have thought, who would have thought here a month ago that Northwestern was going to be a team right there in the mix to win the Big Ten? I mean, who would have thought that anyone but Purdue would be winning the Big Ten? And we're still a long way away from actually getting into that conversation. We'll, of course, give our respect to the Boilermakers too. But that's where we're at as far as Big Ten basketball goes. I was saying before, I think it, I thought it was Purdue, Indiana, Rutgers. Now it's pretty clear. You, it has to be Purdue, Indiana, Northwestern, if not Purdue, Northwestern, Indiana, if you want to go that far. But I think in, it, right now you, you have to. You have to say that Northwestern is the third best team in the Big Ten. They've proven it. And while the rankings and advanced statistics may not really have them yet, there yet, Ken Palm has them in the 40s still, it's a really good basketball team. And at the very least, a really fun basketball team to watch as they've proven over the last few days. We're going to wrap up with some news from around the Big Ten, some news from around the Big Ten. Uh, Big Ten Player of the Week, only one to tell you about today, a whole bunch yesterday. But in women's tennis, Michigan's Juliana Fliegner gets the spotlight all to herself. Congratulations to Julia for winning Athlete of the Week there. In some team news, Maryland is at the top of the Big Ten baseball preseason polls. The poll rules out as such. It's Maryland, Rutgers, Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, and Indiana in the top six. And also, in tennis news, three Big Ten teams are headed to the ITA D1 Men's National Team Indoor Championship, a really fun event that should probably have a slightly shorter name. Number one, Ohio State will be there, along with number four, Michigan, and number 16, Illinois, for a Men's Tennis D1 National Team Indoor Championship bracket format. So that'll be fun to watch, see who wins the indoor national championships in that one with, again, Ohio State, Michigan, and Illinois representing the Big Ten there. It's news from around the Big Ten as far as, well, our betting yesterday. We took a loss. I had Indiana minus two and a half at Northwestern. Wildcat provided us with a very exciting game. I'm not upset about losing that one at all. As far as the schedule for the Big Ten goes for today, we've got softball starting up. No real games of note, note as far as top 25 team matchups go. But four Big Ten non-conference games going on throughout the day today. In men's basketball, Purdue at Maryland, Ohio State on the road as well. I have them in my notes at Maryland too, but that obviously isn't correct. So I'll click around as I'm talking here and get you the actual uh, team and matchup here in a moment. That would be Ohio State at Iowa. That's going on at 9 p.m. Apologies. Women's Lax, number 20, Notre Dame is hosting, or on the road, check that, number four, Northwestern hosting. Uh, Notre Dame, not a Big Ten team when it comes to the cross. So we're rooting for Northwestern there. In women's basketball, a huge matchup. Number two, Indiana hosts number 12, Michigan. That one's going to be really good. If you're a women's basketball fan and you need to be now, go watch that game. Men's hockey, number four, Michigan against number 10, Ohio State. That's going to be really good. Women's basketball is going to be really good. A couple of really, really exciting matchups on both of those. Again, obviously, you need to be a women's basketball fan if you're not yet. It's too exciting to not watch. And also, if you're not a men's hockey fan as well, what better way to get started by looking at Michigan and Ohio State in a top 10 battle on the ice? Thank you for making Locked On Big Ten your first listen today. For your second listen, of course, go check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. Experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's finish up today. A reminder. Be sure to follow along wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, along as well as on Twitter. It's at Locked On Big Ten. One zero at the end when you're typing it out, not T-E-N. And also follow along with me. I'm Nate Dickinson at Nate with Sports. We'll be back tomorrow with more. Until then, again, Nate Dickinson with Locked On.